2 Peter chapter number 1, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's a mouthful there. We don't have time to get to everything today. But I do want you to notice first that verse number 3, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. When we got saved, there wasn't anything that God held back that we needed to live a victorious Christian life for Him. He did not call us to be holy as He is holy and then say, but you got to find your own holiness. No, He robed us in His righteousness. Right? He knew that we could not be holy in the flesh, so He gave us all the tools that we need right here in His manual so that we can live a life that is pleasing unto God. It says in verse number 3, given unto us all things that pertain unto two things, life and godliness. Did Jesus not say that he came to give us life and life more abundantly? So everything that pertains to the life of the new creature that he made us when he saved us, he has given to us so that we could, as the book of Revelation says, reign as king and priest over this flesh and also as a priest that we can commune with God. He held nothing back. But then it says, not only life, but godliness. Right? Nobody looking at me today thinks, that man is godly in the flesh. Right? I, I do not possess any of the qualities of God in the flesh. The flesh is corrupt. Right? That's what verse number three goes, or verse number four goes on to say. Right? That we can escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. This flesh, flesh is lustful. Right? My natural man lust after the world where it was conceived where it was brought forth right all of it having to do with sin but he gave me everything that pertains to godliness that i can walk fashioned after his son to be used of god to bring glory and honor unto god godliness is not me becoming god godliness is yielding to god so that god can get glory from my life right so nothing's held back Right, he gave us, press down, shaking, bubbling over. That's not just talking about blessings. That's talking about everything that we need. He dumped on us when we got saved, whether we realized it or not. It's up to us to utilize it. But then, verse number four, whereby are given us exceeding great and precious promises. Because he called us out according to his holiness, to his perfect plan that was set forth before the foundation of the world, right, we get to get in on those exceeding great promises. Right? We just sang about one. How beautiful heaven must be. Song doesn't seem too exciting if you're not promised heaven. Right? The Bible isn't as sweet without that passage where Jesus said, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Right? There are exceeding great promises. But why are those promises so great, so sweet unto the believer? Because there are days that I don't feel like I'm doing what I can do for God. I may be trying my hardest, but then, you know, the natural man or maybe Satan will come up and just put the thought in my mind, hmm, you could be doing a whole lot more. Right? You, you taught a good Sunday school lesson, which I never think that, but I'm always poking holes in them. You taught a good Sunday school lesson, but man, it seems like a whole lot more people could have, you know, understood it better if you'd have phrased it this way or that way. Right? On those days... I understand that exceeding great promises, the arm of flesh will fail me, but I can do all things through Christ. If I shuck the natural man and don't put faith in my talents, like that song that Sister Crystal sang on Wednesday night, I love that song, right? How great the Father's love for us. 
That third verse goes on to say, I will not boast in anything. Right? No power, no strength, no wisdom. It's not about what I understand, what I can do, the things that I can formulate into sentences. Right? It's about what God can do through me. He can make me go out and eat grass in a field like you did Balaam. Right? I can be acting like a donkey. Or I can yield unto God and be used of God according to His divine purpose. The promises make it known that there are going to be days that I'm weak, but His strength is made perfect in weakness. Right? There are days that it's going to feel like the world's you know, fighting against me, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. He told me to take... His burden on me because His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Those promises are exceeding great promises because we don't understand really what they mean until we get in the situation to where we're prepared for God to reveal it unto us. Right? It's one thing to know that there's a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It's another thing for God to snuggle up next to you and give you that garment of praise when you've got the spirit of heaviness. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to live it. And we can go back to those exceeding great promises that we did not have claim to. Because unless I'm mistaken, nobody in here 100% Jewish. right? We as the Gentiles, we as the offscour, we had no claim to the things of God. But yet, now, we not only have a claim to Him, He's given us exceeding great promises that originally were just given to God's people. But He says, you're a child of the King, and now they apply to you too. They're great promises. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. All the promises, all the things that Jesus did in the flesh while He walked among men, the entirety of the law was to show us that we are not God, we are not holy, but yet Christ did it in the flesh and promised that He would do those things through us if we yield. We can be partakers of the divine nature. What's that? That's the new creature. right? That's the part of me that He put in me he brings out of me. He, as the kids sang on Sunday night, still working on me. But the finished product will be, I'll have a body fashion like His. That divine nature is the life more abundantly. And the promises of God were given so that I could be a partaker of the new man. Right, we don't have time to get into all that, but that alone right there should have us bouncing off the walls and hanging from the chandeliers. That he cared enough about it, not just to save it, but he says, I want to give you a life where you can be a partaker, or as another portion of the Bible says it, we are joint heirs with Christ. Everything he owns, we own, and we get a little taste of it down here. Right? But then, verse number five, and besides this, I mean, in addition to, right, if that wasn't enough, right, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue okay now faith very important there's still a running joke some of them that started the joke are now gone from the teens class but there's still a running joke in the teen class if brother jordan asks a question the chances are the answer is faith well no it's not always faith but a lot of the times it is the answer why because without faith it's impossible to please god it's very important god gave unto every man a measure of faith for by grace are you saved through faith. If you can't get saved without it, you certainly can't live spiritually without it. Right? In fact, what was the great indictment of Israel throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia? That although God had done so much, they lost their faith in God. Right? They turned other directions because the thing that was proven, they didn't put faith in it because it was not seen. Faith, faith is the essence of what hope for, the substance of things not seen. Right? You start off with faith when you get saved. God gave it to you in a measure so that you could exercise it to believe on Him. And with that measure of faith, we can say, but faith is what? It's one of the building blocks. Right? If you don't have faith, you're not going to be profitable. If you don't have faith, God's not going to be able to use you. If you don't have faith, you're going to wallow around for years wondering or not whether you're actually saved. And the entire time, you could be a partaker of the divine nature. But we don't take advantage of the promises because we don't believe that God either meant them for us or that God really would do it for us. Right? I get it. Doubt's a thing. 
but having a moment of doubt and saying Lord forgive me of that I know better rather than living in doubt are two different things right if you live in doubt your soul may be set on the solid rock but your life is standing on shifting sands right you can be standing on the best foundation in the world but if you doubt that's where you need to be you might just jump off still saved but without faith you're not making any progress so Peter says besides this add to your faith first thing add to faith virtue well what's what's virtue well by definition virtue is goodness okay but in this verse it means not just goodness holiness right recall back to Mark's account of the woman with the uh, issue blood, reached up touched the hem of Jesus' garment Jesus stopped in the midst of the crowd and the Bible says he perceived that virtue had gone out of him goodness would not have healed that woman right it was holiness part of his holiness healed the unholiness or sin the curse of that woman right and she was made whole Right? So virtue is not just talking about, well, we do good things. No, no, no. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Best message I've ever heard preached on that was preached by our pastor on holiness, being holy. I don't have time to get through all that. I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it again. But the entirety of the message boils down to we decrease, he increases, we yield, he instructs, we do getting out of the way and following true virtue is not calling the shots true virtue is just saying Lord I need not just help you know every day, every step of the way Lord I need to be hand in hand with you just show me where to go and I'll do my best to do everything that you instruct me to do true holiness is getting out of the way and letting Christ live through you true holiness is trying to get as far out of the limelight as you can so that people will see what God did in your life something that's irrefutable well there's no way he could have done that I've seen people try and turn over new leaves a whole lot the only change that I've ever seen stick is when a sinner gets saved God makes something new in them you can try all you want to but when God does it it's evident right well add to faith virtue let him get out the old man and let him reveal the new man so much so that we become salt and light to the world and they can see there's something different about him and when they see it it's not well what he do well I wonder what secret he's found oh no it's just evident Jesus did it virtue is being so unabashedly proud of what God did in your life that people just see Jesus in everything you do now that's a high goal I get, I get in the way a whole lot more than I'd like right Jordan shows out a whole lot more than Jesus does but the key here is adding to this is a step and we're going somewhere starts with faith then you add virtue if you can't learn how to get out of the way and let God lead again you're stuck in the road you can believe all you want to but unless you put feet onto your faith some things just aren't going to pick up you could say that well I believe that God's going to meet this need but if the next day after you say that you've already got a meeting with the banker well I'm going to go get a loan but did Jesus tell you get the, if Jesus tells you get the loan get the loan Jesus, it's going to be the best loan you ever got interest rates going to be pristine right in fact they may even give you some of that same as cash deal right that'd be a blessing but if Jesus didn't tell you to go see the banker man you don't have faith right maybe there was a great thing around the corner right maybe there was a way that God was going to work that only he could get the credit for but because of a lack of my faith because I didn't live what I believed or said I believed now I've robbed the glory from God and I've given it to the banker man but if we can't live by faith if we can't live with virtue his holiness in us then we're not getting any further down this list 
But then it says, add to your virtue, in verse number uh, 6, or verse number 5, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge. Well, how can I know how to let Christ live through me unless I get in here and learn? Keep in mind, the Bible is still being written when he wrote this. But there were godly men that had such a touch of God on them that they would teach. And it was just as good for that time because God's no respect of persons. Why would we be favored more than them that it's easier for us because we have it all right here? No, if they earnestly sought, they would teach and it would be just like they had a copy of the Bible in front of them. They had, and they made it theirs. They took it everywhere with them. Right? Sometimes we don't even take this out of, the, you know, some people don't take it out of their car between church services. But all they had was what they received and they ingrained it onto their hearts. And they took it with them, they lived it because they were hungering for knowledge about the one that saved them. The one that was so great as to give them a new life. On how he can take an unworthy dog like me and use it for a vessel of honor. And because of that great love that they had for God, they desired to know more about God. We've got all 66 books in front of us, and yet they can, you know, on paper, you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. They did a whole lot more for God than churches nowadays are doing for God. And it wasn't because they had, you know, the complete counsel of the Word of God. They just took whatever they could get and they ran with it. They made it a part of them and they said, Lord, I may not know it all, but help mine unbelief. And they went out and they lived for God. Not saying you've got to have the whole Bible memorized, but you should know more today than you did yesterday. You should know more this year than you did last year. The indictment against most Christians is that when they're faced with trouble, rather than seeing what God says on it, they try and get everybody else's opinion first. But the only opinion that should truly matter to us is, well, what does God have to say about it? Well, Lord, I don't know how to do this. So instead of asking somebody else, Lord, I don't know how to witness. Well, the Bible talks a whole lot about witnessing. It's not that complicated. I mean, the pastor's been harping on it a little bit lately. I don't know why. Maybe somebody got that, that fear that I can't go out and witness. It's real easy. Peter and John, who saw a whole lot, they went into the temple. They, you know, silver and gold have none, but such as I have given by thee. They healed that man at the door to the temple. Right, then they get called in before the elders. They get beat and told not to preach in Jesus' name again. But when they asked them, how did you guys do what you did? And they said, we're just going to tell you what we've seen and what we've heard. That's all it takes to be a witness. You don't have to have a doctorate in theology. right? You don't need to understand every doctrine of the Bible to its fullest extent. All you have to know is what Jesus did for you. What you were and what you are now. You want to learn how to witness? It's right in the Bible. In fact, when Philip went to that Ethiopian eunuch, he's sitting there studying the Word of God. He said, what keeps me from being baptized? That wasn't anything anywhere in the Old Testament. That's why he was so confused. He's going back and forth and, well, why can't I be baptized? Philip said, well, it's really easy. You haven't been saved. Right? It wasn't a big complex answer. Baptism's not salvation. I mean, even a person that just got saved knew that because they got saved when they either came to an altar or wherever they were they got down and they asked God to save them right they know I got saved then it's not in the water right you want to know how I know it wasn't in the water I felt the same when I went in and when I came back out the work had already been done but where do we learn things like that word of God those that are hungry for the knowledge of God they come to church not just because I have to be here or well I'm feeling a little low I want to get some help no 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 we come one to worship but then two they come so that they can hear what God wants to instruct them on Lord what do you need to give me that I wouldn't you know maybe I'm not smart enough to understand it well God's given us a pretty smart pastor but well maybe I'm not you know I've been so stressed out that when I get down and read you know my flesh may have failed me. I may have been too scatterbrained. May not have been able to sit down and you know even think straight while I was reading the Word of God. But God, through His long suffering, 
through His loving, through His kindness. He might just let a man of God get up and say, oh, while we're worshiping God, here's what you've been looking for all week. It's not accident or chance. That's the divine providence of God. But add knowledge. Because if you don't know anything about Jesus, if you don't know about how Jesus wants you to live your life, how can we ever expect to live Christ-like? But then it goes on to say that after we add to our virtue knowledge, knowledge, temperance. Real fun word. Temperance. When I think of temperance, I think of, that we have already talked about canons a few weeks ago. Brother Clint liked that. He had a magazine at home. He brought it to me showing all the different kind of failures that can happen when they go to pour those old brass cannons. Okay, here's another example for you. <clears throat> Back in the day when swordsmiths would make swords, okay, and some of them still do it by hand today, but they would get the iron hot, they'd stretch it out, they'd shape it, right? They'd get everything to where it needs to be. They'd get all the kinks and you know, all the waves knocked out of it. This thing's perfectly straight. It's exactly what it needs to be. But before they quench it, in other words, which is to make it hardened steel, what they do is they put it in a fire, they turn the heat up, and they leave it there for a long time. It's called tempering the steel. And what that does is it takes all the weak spots and all the harder and strong spots and it melds them together to where the whole thing is evenly strong. Because if you don't temper it and there's a weak spot in the metal, you go to hit it against something, it breaks. It snaps. Because somebody tried to cut a corner and they weren't evenly strong throughout. Right? We're not going to be able to master everything, but what God does give to us, it should be evenly applied to our life. No weak spots. Someone that's temperate in the faith does not have an area where the devil can walk around their life and say there's a gap in the hedge. They are diligent about tending to the things that God has given them. They understand they're not perfect. They understand that they're only able to do what they can by the grace of God, but they strive to say, Lord, search me out and show me where I'm weak. Then, Lord, make me strong. They care so much about safeguarding what God has given to them. Being good stewards of the knowledge that God has given them. Good stewards of the virtue that God's imparted unto them. Good stewards of the faith. Right? That was earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Such a good steward that they say, Lord, fortify my life. Put up hedges around me. In your word, show me how to deal with temptations so that temptations don't affect me like they used to. Lord, in your word, show me in those moments where I doubt. Give me a verse that I can go back to that will strengthen my faith. Lord, on those days where I've been put through the ringer, and unless I get a word from heaven, I may be up all night worrying about things and not get any sleep. Lord, on those days, give me a verse that reminds me that I need to cast all my cares upon Him because He cares for us. That I can unload my burdens so that I can be about the Father's business. Lord, give me the tools that I need and then show me how to put them on. But the armor of God's a great thing. It's better when you put it on. It's better when you keep it on. It's better when every now and then the Lord will come by and say, hey, that leather strap to the breastplate might be getting a little loose might want to replace it right because you can have it on but if equipment's only as good as the things that it, you know it's used to attach to you backpack's great it's even better when it stays on your back and doesn't fall off but where do we strengthen our where do we become even throughout that's not just talking about actions. I'm not just talking, just talking about emotions and everything. Temperate means that we are even keel throughout. That when people look at us, they say, that person may not be the best at everything, but there's something about them that life, they got life figured out. No, no. I've just figured out that Jesus can handle my life. When I'm more concerned about listening than I am about giving an answer, 
That's being temperate. But it also goes into the next one. Add to temperance, patience, Brother Randy. That's an inside joke between me and him. He was my Sunday school teacher. He talked on patience one. Jokingly, he said, don't pray for patience unless you really mean it. Why? Because it's hard to add to temperance patience. I mean, okay. Don't know about you guys. Uh, I'm an absolutist. That means it's either yes, no, black or white. That's how I think. It's how, what makes sense to me. Okay? Temperance is, you know, well, Lord, that's a problem. Right? I need to get better at that. Well, stop worrying about that. I can take care of that. Just focus on doing this the best you can. Right? I've got an issue with that. But I also have an issue, not just with patience, but with a lot of things where you just got to sit back and say, but Lord, that's bad. You know, why, don't, why won't you let me say something about that? Well, maybe God's already working on the inside of them, and I just need to. They're under conviction so much. last thing they need is somebody to snap at them and tell them how wicked or ungodly they are. But what's my job? Not my job to be God. Holy Ghost is far you know, more uh, equipped and better able to tell somebody that what they're doing is wrong. What may be my job is to go to them and say, hey, I don't know what you've been going through. Right? But I just want to let you know that you know, God loves you. You've got a friend. Let's go get a bite to eat. Well, that's hard when what they're doing flies in the face of everything that Jesus did for us. Right? When some people's lives are, you know, just apparent that the way that they live their life, you know, insults God and His goodness and His mercy. That, that does something on the inside of me. Right? Those bumper stickers where they say coexist and they got all the things on there, all I see is a bunch of symbols of people that hate Jesus. Right, people that say, well, there are many roads to heaven. Well, Jesus can come to wherever you are and make a way, but he's the way. Right, there are things that just, in my flesh, they make me angry. Because it goes against the grace and the mercy and how holy and, you know, miraculous God really is and the special thing that he did for us in sending his son. Well, no, you can earn your way. Hogwash. That's what I want to say. I want to say, hey, shut up. That's foolishness. But if I do that, then I look judgmental. Right? I look like one of them crazy nutballs that go out and, you know, protest military funerals. Right? Westboro Baptist, I look like them jokers. Right? They're nuts. Right? They've got a form of God that denies the power thereof. Right? But patience is, okay, Lord. Not my will, but thine. Every single time. Not sometimes. All the time. I haven't quite got you know patience figured out all the way, but I am a lot more patient than I used to be. I'll take that as a victory. Okay, used to, short fuse go off. Every, still got a short fuse. Fuse is just very wet now. It's hard to get lit. Okay, but virtue without patience, right? If God's using you to do something and I pop off at the mouth, it may undo all the planting and watering that others have done for the honor and glory of God. Right? Because I may be out in the field plowing, but I want to steer towards somebody and say, all right, today we're digging up this root. Well, if God doesn't want it dug up, I'm going to do a whole lot of damage to the plow. I'm going to do a whole lot of damage to me and chances are I'm going to do a whole lot of damage to that person. Right? Christ never forced anything on anybody. Christ suffered, you know, Charles Spurgeon said that it must have been like for Christ walking in this sin-cursed earth like it'd be for us to walk through a briar patch stark naked. Just the evil and the iniquity always pricking at Him. Right? So if Christ could endure that just to bring salvation for me, I can endure a little bit of you know, getting me out of the way. Really, that's what patience is, is dealing with me. Right? I'd love to say that, you know, hey, I have the patience of Job. Job got himself out of the way a long time before Job had today. That's why Job was able to sit there and wait on the Lord. Because he'd been waiting on the Lord for a whole long time. 
Patience is just shucking me and being able to rest content not only in the promises of God, but in the hope of what God's going to do. Right? But then, it goes on to say, and to patience, godliness. But godliness, brotherly kindness. Easy to have brotherly kindness. What's the first fruit of the Spirit? It was listen, love. It's easy to love people that are member, you know, members of the family of God. Why? Because they got that kindred spirit. Right? His spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm the Son of God. And His spirit bears witness with me that, hey, that's one of them. And it's easy to get to sit down and start talking about Jesus. Hey, it's like I've known a person my whole life. Right? It's easy to love your church family. It's easy to love people that come in the door. We may have never met before, but they get you know, plugged in. They just say, hey, I don't know y'all from Adam, but y'all you know, know the same Jesus I know. So I'm going to get hooked up with you. It's easy to love those people. It's easy to love missionaries that say, for, because of my love for God, because of the call He put on my life, we're leaving all, you know, maybe all security, all comfort, right? All the things that we've taken for granted here in the U.S., and we're headed somewhere out in the middle of nowhere just to tell them how much we love Jesus and how much Jesus loves them. It's easy to love those people because it's apparent that they love Jesus. Right? But brotherly kindness extends further than just brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? Are we not supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves? Right? Christ in his right in in the plane of God, since it's God's will for none to perish, but all to come to repentance. There's a potential brother in every lost person that we meet. There's a potential family member in everyone that we come across. So why wouldn't we show them the same brotherly kindness as we do to ourselves? The world's real good at loving those that are like them. But the world doesn't love those that are different than them. It's called cancel culture now. God forbid you say something that somebody doesn't like, they're going to take everything that you own away from you. What is that? No. Uh, lining things up for the Holocaust, or not Holocaust, for the Antichrist, where there's going to be a Holocaust on all principles and moral value. Everybody got to think the same. Everybody got to walk the same. And they're going to kill everybody that's different. Either get in line or get out. It's all coming down the pipeline. But the world hates people that are different. People, or the world uses people's differences as a reason to hate them. It's been that way throughout all history. But you're different. We don't like that. So either change or we're going to kill you. Or if you don't change, we're just going to make it a whole lot harder for you to live in society. And then eventually you'll just succumb to the pressure to change. Not well. It's easy to love brothers. Hard to love people that may not be in the family yet, but God wants them to be. But then, it says brotherly kindness. And add to your brotherly kindness, charity. Charity is the last one. Okay, by definition, charity is just love. But see, brotherly kindness is one thing. you got something in common with that person. If they're not a member of the family of God, I was where that person used to be. And I love them enough that I don't want them to stay there. I want them to get to Jesus. There's commonality there. Right? Charity, something completely different. That's regardless of how much you have in common or how much you don't. Charity is regardless of how long you've known the person or how new they are. Could be a stranger that you'll never see again. Charity is giving God's goodness to somebody else just because God said so. Charity was when the Apostle Paul, when they prayed at, sang songs at midnight, God sent an earthquake, all the cells opened up. Paul was still in his cell, but yet somehow he knew that the Philippian jailer pulled out his sword and was ready to take his life. Charity was, he called out and said, do yourself no harm. Right, that man was guilty of 
imprisoning, if not beating, the man of God that was sent to the town. But that man was guilty of fighting against the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet out of charity, he said, do yourself no harm. Then, as a result of it all, he gets saved. Not just him, his whole house. And then, a church starts out of it. Then the Apostle Paul writes an epistle back to him. But what, what was all that based on? Charity. Charity is when somebody may not deserve it. Charity, I mean, there are people you meet in the church, they deserve love from other people. But they're just one of them people that they care about others so much they just deserve to have people care about them. Right? That they care so much about God, it's just, it's hard not to care about them. But they love God so much, it's just easy to love them. Then there's other people, it's hard to love. Inside church, outside, it doesn't matter. But there are just some people that, mostly because of my flesh, I get a burn in my saddle and I say, I don't want to love that person. Charity is regardless of how much it hurts me, if God says do it, love them, and don't do it begrudgingly, love them with your whole heart. Charity truly is getting a little bit of that unconditional love that God had for us inside of us and letting it show out. It doesn't mean anything to love family members. You're stuck with them. You either got to love them or you got to, you know, kick them out of the family. That's just how it is. You're not allowed to come to any more reunions because nobody likes you. Okay, I wish I could do that, but I'd probably be number one on the list, though, if we started that vote. Let's be honest. And I don't know that I'd be so much offended at that. Really, really don't like going to them things too much. But the point is, we don't get to play survivor and say, nope, you're off the island. I'm not going to show you the love of God. Why do you think the charity was the last thing in this list? Because it's one of the hardest things to implement truly in your life. The charity of God. It takes a whole lot more preparation by the Holy Ghost before you can master charity. That's where you get to the point that you don't see what's on the outside. You look at the need on the inside. You put all those things that might be offended in yourself. You understand that the Apostle Paul was raised not to go around certain people, not to eat certain foods, not to dress a certain way, that there were certain things that he didn't do because they were below him and they would make him unholy. You know what he did throughout his missionary life? He did a lot of those things. And he ended up writing that if somebody put food in front of him, he didn't want to offend that person. So he would offend his former self, the old man, so that Christ might be able to use an open door to save that person. So it's not about what I think, not about what I feel. Right? I don't know why. I mean, they couldn't eat bacon. I feel sorry for them. Right? They couldn't eat pigs. But if he was out in the Gentile world, somebody put down a pork chop in front of him, he said he would endure the fact that maybe he didn't like pork because he would never had it before. Right, or maybe somebody threw down a whole bunch of seaweed in front of them and said, hey, this is the best we got. I, I eat seaweed sometimes with sushi, but then not just seaweed. I, that's ocean grass. Who, who just walks around eating grass? Right, we're not goats. But the point, I can swallow that in order to give them charity. He's saying, I rain the flesh in. Doesn't matter how much it hurts me, how much it's an inconvenience to me, how much it may annoy me. I'll swallow it to show them not the love of man, but the love of God. You know why people use the word charity nowadays? Because you're taking of your surplus and giving it to somebody else that doesn't have it. You know what you got to do in that situation? Well, you may have to swallow a little bit of pride. You know what charity, when it talks about charity in the Bible, it means loving somebody enough that you stop looking at what it may do to you and you just give them what God wants to do in their life their need right? the pastor gets up, he may preach a hard message but every time he gets up he preaches it out of charity because he knows that it's what God said somebody needed he preaches it in love even though it may be a hard thing to preach 
And I guarantee you, if it's hard to listen to, it's harder to preach. Right? But then, going to, giving the gospel to somebody, your flesh will give you a whole bunch of reasons on why you can't. Well, look at the time, or you've got this going on, or if you don't get back in time, the boss is going to get angry. Right? If your lunch break is a little bit over, you may get a, you know, a write-up on the job. Well, who cares about that if God wants to save somebody? Are we willing to junk it all for one? Charity would. Because Jesus left heaven for one. The love of God that we love to sing about is sacrificial. Charity means that I lose something so that somebody else can gain. Otherwise, it's not love. If I'm given to get, that's not charity. That's an investment. Right? God gave for the lowest of the low. Those that were born in sin that, you know, were testaments of what Adam and Eve did in the garden and how they chose not to obey God. But He wants to redeem them and make them sons of glory. And that's charity. What could we give to God? It's not about what we can get out of it. It's about what God can get out of the situation. And what's that? Glory and honor. Even if someone doesn't accept, if we give in charity, we're saying, God's so great that I'm willing to give all this up if you'll just listen to me. Doesn't matter how inconvenient. Doesn't matter what time of day. Doesn't matter if somebody calls me up at 3 in the morning because they're under conviction. Well, one, it'd be an act of God if I heard it at 3 in the morning because it takes a whole lot to wake me up. Right? But, not about me. Charity is all about them. The difference between brotherly kindness and charity is when we get to focus off of people and we just get to focus on, I love God so much, i got to tell somebody. No matter the cost. No matter where I have to go. No matter what I might have to give up so that I can be free to go and do it. And as a result, we get to verse number 8, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you get to the point where all of those things are flushed out in your life and God has made that work complete in your life not saying that you'll bear much fruit you know some 10 some 20 some 100 but you'll bear fruit and you'll be able to stand before the Lord and say Lord I did my best I let you work in me so that you could use me as an instrument and a vessel for you and I did my best to yield and to give what you put in me to other people. You want to know what the consequences of not putting those things into your life and allowing God to manifest them in your spirituality? That's verse number 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You want an indictment on modern day Christianity? Most people forgot that Jesus saved them. They've gotten over the fact that they're blood-washed, born-again Christians. They love God, but they don't love God enough to give up who they want to be so that God can make them into what He wants them to be. They are blind, short-sighted. All they're thinking about is what's next, what's next, what's next. They have no thought for eternity. They don't look at a person and see their eternal need. They look at the temporary inconvenience, uncomfortableness. That comes from what I don't want to deter from what I'm doing to go and tell that person. Selfishness. Because we've forgotten how low we really were when God found us. And we take for granted what He's given us. And as a result, we're spoiled. I mean, we're neither cold nor hot. The Lord will spew us out of, our, out of His mouth. But we're also just spoiled. It's not that we're lukewarm. It's the fact that we're spoiled milk. That everything that was good that God could have done with us, we've let go to rot. We take no thought for things to come. 
All we care about is what we're going to do after church today, where we're going to go eat, who we're going to have, what excuse we're going to be able to come up with on why we're not coming back tonight. Short-sighted. When really, from eternity, not only did God love us with an everlasting love, but He had an everlasting plan that whosoever could come, and it was predestined that those that were saved were conformed to the image of His Son. That we become Christ-like after you get saved. That was the whole plan. And by not allowing God to fulfill that plan, right, we trample the blood of Jesus Christ. And it, the cross has become none effect to us. And as a result, we just live our life every day with everything in front of us right here so that we can block out everything that God might want us to do so that we can do what we want to do. Because we don't have charity. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.